at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, he proved through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled Thanking Professor Shepard and his accompanist, whose name I should know, <laughs> and it's on my piece of paper, David Hol Holkbor. Thank you both. Good afternoon, and welcome to our September 11th commemoration ceremony. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this important event, both in person and virtually. That's why we're holding it in this room so that we can also have our virtual audience with us today. I'd also like to extend my sincere thanks to John Jay, John Jay Foundation board member Alicia Washington, the student and alumni participants, and everyone in our commu <coughs> community who devoted their time <coughs> and creative efforts to produce our 9-11 remembrance events, and yes, I would get a frog in my throat right now. Mm -hmm. And I especially want to thank Mindy Boxstein, who is the architect of everything we do in remembrance of 9-11. Of on this day, 22, I'm good now, on this day 22 years ago, our country, city, and community witnessed an unthinkable act of violence that robbed our society of nearly 3,000 beautiful lives. That included 343 firefighters and paramedics, 23 police officers, 37 Port Authority officers, and countless civilians. Among those innocent lives taken from us were 67 John Jay family members, members of our community here. Just like our current students, these fallen heroes walked in the halls of our campus, sat in our classrooms, and committed themselves to a life of service. Many of our event participants were either very young and many were not even born when the Twin Towers were attacked. That yet they stand with us today determined to preserve the legacy of those we've lost. How do we keep their spirit alive in our hearts? How do we live up to the sacrifice they made to save others? We keep their spirit alive by telling their stories and celebrating their lives, which we'll do today. We live up to their sacrifice by taking up their torch of service and committing ourselves to helping others. We stay true to their memories by upholding our core values of justice, diversity, equity, integrity, and respect, while we actively disrupt hateful ideologies that lead to unspeakable violence. Today's student and alumni participants are forever linked to the 67 heroes we lost 22 years ago today, along with many alumni still fighting illnesses connected to the tragedy. When our students, faculty, and alumni go out into the world and move the needle forward toward a more just society, they are honoring our 9-11 heroes in the most fitting way. I'm looking forward to hearing today's poetry, songs, and stories and I hope you all as well. So thank you for joining us to commemorate those lives that we lost 22 years ago today.
One last time. What do I do now? I'm in a constant battle with myself trying to be strong and move on, but my mind just goes back to you. How I'm expected to go about my day as if you hadn't just gone. How I'm expected to move at the pace as everyone else, but I can't. Time is ticking and I'm unable to catch up. How that one day changed my life forever and those around me, but I'm expected to cope and be strong, but being strong to me is just an act because no way can I ever forget you. No way can I go on and act as if I don't want to hug you one last time, share a laugh one last time, take a picture with you one last time. Who knew that it would be the last time families will say see you later, that it would be the day loved ones took their last breath, that they will go to work for the last time, grab coffee for the last time, have a meeting for the last time, share a hug for the last time, speak and share their thoughts, feelings, jokes for the last time. The breath that once filled those lungs are no longer there. The smiles that were once displayed to show emotions of happiness are no longer there, just washed away into the minds of their loved ones called a memory. Because with just that single day, that one single tragic day, everything changed. Families no longer with those who they cherish, which still leaves scars on their hearts years later. Many needing to gasp for air because they need a minute to breathe and grasp what just took place, what changed their life so much in an instant, what they would do just to hug their daughter, son, mother, father, lover, friend, just one last time. Thank you. Resilient Hearts, a reflection on the legacy of 9-11. 8.46 a.m., nothing was ever the same. People looked up and saw smoke outside their window pane. A tower was taken from us and no one could understand. Through the smoke and confusion, together we stand. 9.03 a.m., people looked up in fear as the second tower was hit. It became very clear, someone twisted was behind this. Firefighters and policemen rushed to the scene and towards the buildings they ran with sirens blaring in our ears and dust in our lungs. Together, we stand. <clears throat> 2,977 dead. Tears stream through the streets as the names are said. As broken as we are, we walked and we held each other's hands. On the Brooklyn Bridge home, together we stand. Our brothers and sisters have perished. The pain is still deep. Every night, I could still hear Lady Liberty weep. We must remember the sacrifices and, to get, and we must advance with folded American flags in our hearts. Together, we stand. Our differences aside, as Americans, we lead. Our stripes are our color. Our stars are our creed. From the folks in the city to those in the ranch, one nation indivisible, together we stand. On 9-11, I was still in my mother's womb. One generation later, I could still feel the gloom. Every year, we must take a moment, look around and glance, and vow a pledge of allegiance to justice. Together, we stand. The land of the free and the home of the brave. We must work together to protect each other's freedoms every day. The seeds of tomorrow, together, today we plant, with liberty and justice for all. Together we stand. So good afternoon, I'm Diego Redondo. I'm standing in for Brian Kerr right now. Uh, it is our tradition at John Jay College to invite representatives of our community to recite the names of those who we lost on September 11, 2001. They were first responders, administrators, faculty, students, and staff. As we read the names of our 67 fallen community members, please keep them and their loved ones in your thoughts. At the end of the ceremony, we will place flowers and origami cranes by the memorial. The cranes were gifted to us by Japanese school children on the 15th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Paper cranes were also made by alumna Melinda Yam to add to this collection. Following September 11, 2001, Japanese children hand-folded 1,000 paper cranes as a gift to New York City. 
based on the ancient legend that anyone who folds 1,000 paper cranes will be granted a wish. Their wish was for world peace. With that, I will start off reciting the names, uh, beginning with Ignatius Andanga, the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, Brian Ahern, FDNY, Gerard Barbara, FDNY, Frank Bonomo, FDNY, Michael Boyle, FDNY, Michael Brennan, FDNY, Peter Brennan, FDNY, Patrick Brown, FDNY, Ronald Buka, FDNY, William Burke Jr., FDNY, Michael Camerata, FDNY, Charles Carroll, FDNY, Vernon Cherry, FDNY, Michael Clark, FDNY, John Collins, FDNY, John Coglin, NYPD, James Coyle, FDNY. Robert Crawford, FDNY. Scott Davidson, FDNY. Dennis Devlin, FDNY. Jerome Dominguez, NYPD. Kevin Donnelly, FDNY. Stephen Driscoll, FDNY. Gerard Duffy, FDNY. Fanny Espinoza, Cantor Fitzgerald. Michael Esposito, FDNY. Robert Evans, FDNY. John Fanning, FDNY. Thomas Foreno, FDNY. Terrence Farrell, FDNY. Andrew Fredericks, FDNY. Thomas Gambino Jr., FDNY. Marilyn Garcia, Marsh and McLennan. Edward Garanti, FDNY. John Giordano, FDNY. Sean Hanley, FDNY. Terrence Hatton, FDNY. John Heffernan, FDNY. Ronnie Henderson, FDNY. Walter Hines, FDNY. Carl Joseph, FDNY. Michael Kiefer, FDNY. Thomas Kennedy, FDNY. Ronald Kerwin, FDNY. Joseph Levy, FDNY. Joseph Maloney, FDNY. Peter Martin, FDNY. Michael Lyons, FDNY. Robert McMahon, FDNY and Charles Mills, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance. Robert Minara, FDNY. Dennis Mojica, FDNY. John Moran, FDNY. Robert Nagel, FDNY. William O'Keefe, FDNY. Oreo Palmer, FDNY. Philip S. Petty, FDNY. Maria Ramirez, Langan Engineering and Environmental Services. Digna Rivera Costanza, Marsh and McLennan. Jacqueline P. Sanchez, Cantor Fitzgerald. Leo Smith, Jr., FDNY. Kevin Smith, FDNY. Walwyn Stewart, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Santos Valentin, NYPD. John Vigiano, FDNY. Lawrence Virgilio, 
FDNY, Edward White, FDNY. On September 11th, alumnus David Chong was a lieutenant in the NYPD Organized Crime Investigation Division. I was at 40 Rector Street when I heard this tremendous boom and the entire building shook. To my shock and absolute dismay, when I exited on Rector Street, I saw that a major airline had hit the North Tower. I felt the heat and it was just raining down debris. Then I started to see body parts and I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. Crowds were standing around looking up, frozen in complete shock. It was so surreal. People would jump into their death from such a high place. I remember seeing a body bounce against a building and just break into pieces. As I made my way to the North Tower, I was screaming at people to run. Then I heard over a police radio that another airplane was coming in. I looked up and saw an airline swim inside the South Tower. I thought it was a nightmare. I saw an officer carrying two oxygen tanks heading for a stairwell. Showing him the police badge pinned to my suit check, I said, here, give me one and I'll come to the stairwell with you. Making our way up to the 11th and 12th floor of the South Tower, I could smell the burning building, jet fuel and flesh. All of my senses were intensified in the chaos. Two exhausted men were bringing down a woman who was very badly burned. All three of them were covered in blood. I took the hurt woman from the arms of the two men and told them to get out of the building as fast as they could. I tried to administer oxygen to the injured woman, but panic set in and I couldn't get the tank to work. I remember she was speaking Spanish to me and talking about her niños, which were her children. I told her, stay with me. The ambulance are downstairs and you're going to see your children once we get to the ambulance. After we stumbled through the lobby, I took off my suit jacket to cover her exposed body. I looked out onto Church Street and saw the flashing lights. We just have to make it to those flashing lights, I thought to myself. She'll be okay if we make it to those flashing lights. As we were walking, the floor opened up like a sinkhole. I lost my grip on her. I never saw her again. On September 11th, Erin Coughlin was 16 years old. Her father, NYPD Sergeant John Coughlin, a John Jay student, rushed to the World Trade Center as part of the NYPD's Emergency Services Unit. At six foot two, my father was this big teddy bear of a human being. I'm the oldest of three girls and he was a proud girl dad. He told us every chance he could get that he loved us. When it was career day at school, he'd always come in with all this cool NYPD stuff. He wanted us to be proud of the work he did and we always were. On September 11th, my dad went to work extra early so I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to him. I was in my third period math class when an announcement came over the loudspeaker. The principal explained that there had been a plane crash at the World Trade Center. I was looking out the window at the time and I had this weird feeling even before the announcement was made. I had a gut feeling that something was wrong. I knew dad would be down there because that's what his unit did. They rescued people. I made my way home from school that day and the phone was rigging off the hook. Everybody was wondering if dad was okay. At 10 o'clock that night, a call came in informing my mother that her husband was officially listed as missing. The last radio transmission that we know of stated that his unit was on 20th floor of the South Tower. Dad's unit grabbed all the ropes, harnesses and gear off the truck and went in as fast as they could. They just wanted to get people down the stairs to safety. In the midst of the chaos, my dad ran into an old high school friend. He said that my dad looked him in the eye and urged him to run for his life. I think they all knew it was going to be bad. A few of the guys even found a way to quickly call home. When my dad went into those buildings on September 11th, they were grabbing people and helping them run away. It didn't matter what they looked like, what they believed in, what political party they were in or anything like that. They knew that there were thousands of people in that building who had heartbeats and they went in to get them out. In 2012, Erin Coughlin found the best way she could to honor her late father. 
After graduating from the police academy and becoming an NYPD police officer, she put on a badge inscribed with her father's shield number. The summer before September 11th, FDNY Fire Marshal Ronald B. P. Booker, a John Jay alumnus, dropped off his son, Ron, at college. It was the last time father and son would see each other. At the end of August 2001, I was an undergraduate in New Orleans. Dad drove me down there to help me move into the dorm. We got out in New Orleans for a night and saw the sights. Then he headed back to New York City. The night before September 11th, I talked to my dad like any other college kid. We were trying to work out the money for the flight home for Thanksgiving. It was a normal conversation. I love you. Talk soon. Then the next morning, I woke up for classes and saw what was happening on television. I tried to get a hold of my mother, but because she was a nurse, she was busy setting up a triage unit. Finally, I got in touch with my grandmother and she told me my dad was at the site. At about 10 o'clock that evening, I got a call from the fire marshal saying, we haven't heard from your dad yet. You may want to come home. Since there were no available flights, I hopped in a car and drove from Louisiana to New York. I wanted to start looking for him right away. If anybody was gonna find my dad, it was going to be me. At the time, my dad was working downtown on Lafayette Street. Throughout his career, he investigated the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and had an intricate knowledge of the towers. When the first plane flew into the North Tower, he immediately spoke to his supervisor, and together, they rushed over to the buildings. Just as they were parking, the South Tower was hit. They navigated their way through the lobby towards the stairwell that would give them a direct route to the upper floors. En route, his supervisor saw a woman who was badly burnt and incapacitated, so he helped her out the building. Dad continued going up towards the 78th floor of the South Tower. I learned through radio transmissions and eyewitness accounts that his unit was trying to put out more water on the fire, and my dad was providing first aid to the people who had been injured. All his training and education accumulated in this one moment. I obviously wish I had more time with him, but I truly believe he was where he was supposed to be, doing what he loved. Like all firefighters, I think he wanted to get to the point of impact to try to start to put out the fire, no matter how insurmountable that might have been. Days later, they found his body in a pocket of space by a stairwell. His coat was on a lady he was trying to save. On September 11th, alumnus Stephen Heavey was working as an FDNY fire marshal. He was at his office in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, about to end his shift, when the radio call came in that the North Tower was hit by an aircraft. The radio started going crazy. They announced a third alarm at the World Trade Center. And I turned to my supervisor and said, that doesn't sound good. I looked at the North Tower and began counting the floors. One, two, three, four, five, six, six floors of wall to ceiling fire. From the 99th, thir to the, from the 93rd to the 99th floor, I knew it was bad. The fire was so big. There was no way we could put it out. The only thing we could do was bring people down below the fire. My supervisor and I ran out of the office as fast as we could, jumping into a sedan, driving on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. When we got off of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in Lower Manhattan, it was wall-to-wall -wall cars. I turned to him and said, we have to get out and go on foot the rest of the way. 
I put on my bulletproof vest, my firefighting gear, grabbed my equipment, and started running toward the Trade Center. It was pure chaos when we got there. My supervisor told me to find my marshals and bring them to the West Bay Street so we could come up with a plan. As I'm frantically waving guys over to me, all of a sudden, one of them says, there he goes. I craned my neck up and saw the South Tower panicking downward with all this smoke and steam coming out. Boom after boom after boom. The building was coming down. We began running for our lives. I ducked behind a building and was hit by sand, pellets, and all sorts of debris. Then suddenly a huge plum of dust enveloped the entire area. I couldn't see, my eyes were burning. I couldn't breathe. My life flashed before my eyes. I thought, this is it. I'm going to die. As the dust cleared a little, I put my cheek to the gutter and attempt to gasp for air. I thought, maybe we're gonna make it. I got up, got on my radio to see where everybody was and tried to figure out what we could do. Then the second tower collapsed. I can still hear it, smell it and see it. I don't know if hell exists, but it does. I've seen it. I was in hell that day. In the days, weeks, and months following the attacks, Stephen would work at the temporary morgue setup at the World Trade Center site. Today, he continues to process what he experienced and strongly advocates for mental health services for first responders. On September 11th, alumna Linda M. Reynolds was the Chief Deputy Sheriff in the New York City's Sheriff's Office. She was at the World Trade Center site helping in the response effort, assisting in the triage and contributing with the recovery. <clears throat> when I woke up the morning of September 11th, it was the most beautiful September day. The sky was blue and clear, the sun was out, and the air still felt like summer. Never in my wildest dreams did I, think, did I think it would quickly become one of the worst days of my life. Two commercial planes hit the Twin Towers, and all first responders, police officers, firefighters, paramedics rushed to the site, including me. Everyone wanted to go in and do anything they could to help. I remember the chaos of that day so clearly, the fear we felt the fire shooting out from the building, the smell of smoke in the air, the sound of innocent people crying, screaming, and dying. There was just so much panic and confusion. Everyone was running. No one knew what was going on because no one was sharing any information, not federal, state, city, or county. I called deputies, getting as many officers as I could from the five boroughs to come down to the World Trade Center as quickly as possible. In the triage area off-site, I did my best to comfort those who have escaped the burning towers. Then the buildings came down. We were shocked into silence, an eerie, deafening silence. All I could think were about the people, the first responders who ran into those buildings to save lives, and they never made it out. In the days that followed, I felt shock, anger, and sadness. There was just so much unimaginable heartbreak. But amid the heartbreak, there was also light. I saw firsthand the resiliency of the human spirit, the capacity to love, people from all over the country wanting to support us. Every state sent volunteers to help with the recovery efforts. They wanted to feed us, to clothe us, and to let us know that we weren't alone. Eternal resilience. In shadows cast by towers toll, a day engraved forever recall. When skies turned dark and spirits wept, the world united, hearts were kept. 
From dust and debris, heroes emerge. Their courage, a flame that never purged. In the face of chaos, they stood strong. Resilient souls, where hope belong. The fallen souls, eternally remembered. Their spirits lingered, never surrendered. Their voices whisper in a gentle breeze, a testament to strength, the word to seize. Admits the sorrow, unity took flight. A beacon of hope, shining bright. And joined together across the land. Love's prevailing force, forever in demand. Through tears and pain, a nation's grace, bound by grief, but faith embraced. From shattered fragments, dreams rebuild. As heart he wounds, love instilled. Let not the darkness overshadow light, for hope and kindness we forever ignite. In unity, we rise, we heal, and we grow. Through adversity, the seeds of compassion sow. So let's honor the lives we have lost with each sunrise embracing the cost. In remembrance, we forge a better day, where love and peace will forever stay. In the hearts of families left behind, a pain, a void, impossible to bind. Their loved ones taken on that fateful morn, innocent lives forever torn. Children who grew up without a father's care. Mothers who faced a lifetime of despair. Siblings missing their brother and sisters dear. The weight of their absence, a constant every seer. Yet in their grief, they found strength anew. A bond that is tragically only grew supporting one another and an end. In unity, they helped each other stand. Through tears and sleepless nights, they cope with memories cherished and dreams of hope. Each day, they carry their loved one's light, their spirit guiding them through the darkest night. In honoring those they owed so dear, they keep their memory forever near. Through acts of kindness and deeds of grace, they create a legacy in the scared place. So let us remember not just the towers tall, but the families who endured the fall. May their courage and resilience inspire as we pay tribute to those we deeply admire. Good afternoon. Although today is a solemn day, it is a great comfort to be with all of you together as a community on this 22nd anniversary of the September 11th attacks. September 11th was a day of profound human tragedy, leaving destruction, heartbreak, grief, confusion, and uncertainty in its wake. A day that we must continue to reflect upon and never forget. I distinctly remember where I was on September 11, 2001. I was only a few weeks into my freshman year of college, some 80 miles away from lower Manhattan. I was starting my daily routine, heading to class, no different from any of the victims of the attacks who were going about their daily life and fulfilling their own purpose in the world. I have vivid memories of the palpable collective fear and deep concern for others at Ground Zero, feeling helpless as I watched on television, the smoke rise over Manhattan and first responders and volunteers 
tending to the recovery effort, sacrificing their own well-being for others. In fact, I would see that same smoke continue to rise and cover the skies during a trip into Manhattan less than a week later. But despite the horror of September 11th, in the aftermath, unity emerged. We saw the best of humanity in response to the worst of humanity. Across the country and city, people of all backgrounds and abilities came together to respond to and assist our city in crisis. Many channeled their energies and emotions by enlisting in the military or participating in charitable work. Some worked to find ways to honor the victims and rebuild Lower Manhattan. Others placed their efforts towards strengthening our country's preparedness to prevent future attacks and to counter extremism. The enduring legacy of 9-11 is resilience and public service, both very much aligned with the mission of John Jay College. Members of the John Jay College community are change agents and fierce advocates for justice. We are inspired by the sacrifices of that time and strive to commit ourselves to serving others today and every day. This should all give us hope for the future. We lead in service during this time of reflection and remembrance. Whether it is beautifying a park or landmark, packing meals for those facing food insecurity, or working a bone marrow drive. But our service does not end after this period. It continues throughout the year. Through our work, scholarship, and civic engagement to fight injustice, we build important bridges in our communities and help create a more inclusive culture, a sense of belonging for all. And by taking on and living this responsibility, we are honoring the John Jay alumni and faculty who answered the call on September 11th. While today we look back and pay tribute to those who lost their lives on this tragic day 22 years ago, we can also look ahead with hope. My faith and hope for a better, more just, and inclusive society remain strong especially because of the mission and work of our college community and the promise of the new generation of students. With all of us working together as one to advance the legacy of service of our heroes, we can move our city, our country, and indeed our world towards a society where peace and justice reign. Begin with 
with me. Let this be the moment now. With every breath I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Thank you, that was beautiful. And um, I wanna say thank you to all of you all because it is beginning with us. And please join me as we process silently to the memorial um, to lay cranes and flowers in honor of uh, all of those we lost 22 years ago today. And we have a special new addition to our memorial. You'll see two lights representing the towers now under the um, plaque that was set um, on the 15th anniversary. So um, please join us as we process and remember that the peace begins with all of us. Thank you. <laughs> 